we're going to talk about some. Uh, I'm going to talk about some stuff that's uh, you know very fresh off the press for SRL and very kind of unprecedented. The past uh, six months that have sort of you know wound up uh, in us uh, having our foot in the door of the art world after 39 years, and uh, talk a little bit. Uh, you know a little bit about a little bit about some historical things about SRL for the benefit of uh, those who just don't know anything about it because as I always like to say we're very widely unknown and so what I'm going to do is just uh, in the background I'm going to play play just sort of a, a, a selection of clips from shows uh, and now I got to turn the sound down here. Uh, I can find it. Audio. Let's see here. So, so how I came to be here and to be doing the things you see behind me, beginning back in 1978, was basically a process where you know, I was in high school and I was a very politically active person in high school, and I was very interested in technology and I was taking courses, mathematics courses, and you know, really kind of preparing myself basically. I saw myself as kind of a, a scientist, I think. But at a certain point, I became, you know, I came to realize uh, partly because of, you know, anti-war stuff I was doing. And there was a very, there was a very big technology company that was really pretty much very uh, mainly involved in war, military war production electronics called EMR in town. And so I was involved, uh, I was involved, I knew about them because I was, I happened to have a mimeograph machine and the people at the local college found out I had a mimeograph machine. And so I started printing up uh, anti-war stuff that we would distribute in the high school. And so I, you know, I became, a, you know, I was very aware of like, you know, I, somehow it crossed my mind that, okay, if I'm gonna prepare myself to be a full on scientist, basically what I'm faced with is this wall of war you know, warfare or something, you know, commerce at least, you know, and I was like, do I really want to go there? And so I changed course in high school and I went into sort of more of a blue collar worker kind of thing where I learned how to do, uh, took machine shop course, which I ended up teaching because the, because the, uh, the, the teacher didn't know anything about, uh, anything about uh, machines or manufacturing or anything like that. So I got my foot in the door with sort of manufacturing engineering there. And I realized I liked the tools. Uh, I got out of high school and I was like, you know what, I'm going to, and then by then I kind of decided I kind of was interested in the arts and interested in moving in that direction. But I was like, all the artists I knew were just sort of like meager, money meager kind of beggar bums. And I was like, you know, I don't want to live like hand to mouth. When are you going to get time to work, right? You got to have money, right, to do anything. So, so I, I went and learned. Uh, yeah, I went and I worked. I ended up with all these jobs because I guess I was pretty good at that stuff. You know, one one job I did, which was a very uh, educational position, was I worked uh, for a, a big machine shop in uh, Northern Florida when I was 18. And the first thing they asked me to go, do you read blueprints? I said, oh, yeah, I taught myself how to read blueprints. And he goes, well, can you read these blueprints? And he walked me back to the back and he showed me these blueprints from the Air Force that were like eight feet wide. And I was like, yeah, you know, I said, this is the call out for this. And I went through all the call outs on this huge page. And he goes, well, do you know what these things are? And I said, no. And he goes, these are target robots for the F-111s. He goes, we have to make like a few of these things. And he goes, I said, well, how big are they? And he goes, well, look at them. And I looked, I flipped through the drawings. We, he had to help me flip through because the pages were huge. They were 30 ton robots that ran on railroad tracks. And he goes, he goes, this is what we're going to be making and you're going to be the first guy on this project. So I started doing it and, you know, I was good enough where after a couple of weeks, they said, you're the foreman on the job. And I was like 18. And so then they hired these other guys who were like 40 and 50 to work under me. So I did that for like almost a year. You know, I learned a lot about manufacturing engineering, you know, and working with these huge tools. I mean, it was a big place, giant machine tools and stuff. And they would just say, yeah, you know how to run a lathe. Just go run that 12 foot long lathe. And, uh, you know, so from start to finish, I built one and a half of these. And then had to go back to, you know, 
and then I went out and, and you know had to go back to my hometown, and then ended up moving out to California. Worked in the oil fields, welding high pressure pipes, and you know so I was I was uh, exposed to a lot of really intense, heavy industrial, critical type of operations. And then I went to art school for four years, and I learned about the wonders of not working for a living, and just the wonders of not doing anything practical. And I didn't really do, you know, any, you know, I did, I kind of have had a lot of crazy ideas that, you know, but mostly it was, I did mostly traditional arts. So if I got a degree in visual arts, but there was a, you know, there was a very big uh, kind of a punk rock scene going at my school. This was in the late seventies and a bunch of the people went to New York and they were in bands and stuff. But I ended up going out to San Francisco. I didn't really know why, but I ended up going out there and Shortly, I just I realized, you know, San Francisco was undergoing the Bay Area was undergoing this transformation to sort of a an industrialized economy to a high tech economy, and so what that meant was that there were all these places that were previously industrial facilities that were literally abandoned. I don't know if anybody remembers San Francisco, but like for instance, where Costco is in San Francisco is where a huge brewery was. And so they were, there were all these places, and I just, you know, being an adventurous and curious young man, I started just going into them, and I realized that they were just open, and there was like factories inside, like complete factories with like all this production equipment, and I was like, holy crap, you know? And I started collecting that stuff. I started thinking about collecting it, and then I just said, wait a minute. And I just came up with the idea of doing survival research labs. I came up with the idea of repurposing industrial military equipment uh, and creating machines that had no practical value or use, but that were formed from things that did have use value. And to create them and to prove that they worked, basically like experiments that would prove that they, that they functioned, uh, and they would be shows, public shows. And so I just, uh, in 1978, I just started I had a purpose because to me it was like, you know, I realized that to, to even to get there at all, and, and I had been exposed to that when I was a kid at these production facilities, but I just didn't buy the story because the story was you've got to have, you're doing this because it's like benefiting the military and that's important to the country and like this is like going to make it so the F-111 jets can go down and do strafing moves on robots and it's all, you know, they're going to go kill people in Vietnam and we're going to win. And, and then I worked at other places, the oil places. I said, we need this for the economy to make money. And I was like, but what about the beaches in Isla Vista where I'm living, which are destroyed from oil? Wait a minute. You know, I just never believed the story. And so I decided, but I decided that the structure was important. The tools were important. The technology was important and the structure was important. So the first thing I had to do was create a reason to do it. So I created SRL as the reason to do it. And then I created a structure to do it, which was to create SRL as a company because I realized companies are the ones that get away with everything. Bef way before, 37 years before Citizens United, I said, aha, if I ever want to like, destroy like cities and destroy people's lives or you know do anything powerful you know no matter what it is I have to be a company to get away with it to actually just to do it so I created a structure and then uh, you know and I, then, I, and then I got a warehouse so there was a place to do it in and so you know I started off as a company I started doing these shows and lo and behold almost immediately scientists were attracted to SRL and started coming to the, you know, not, not artists, you know, not like there were artists that were interested, but full on scientists from places like Stanford started coming and saying, we want to work with you, we want to help you out. And so, in fact, the first important science uh, advisor that was at SRL was Phil Paul, who was from Stanford. He was getting his doctorate here in uh, uh, sensor technology, mostly dealing with laser sensors and stuff. And so he goes, yeah, I can help you build lasers, I can help you at all. So we started off, you know, that was in 78 or 70, 79, you know, which was at the time, you know, building a 50 watt CO2 laser was fairly high tech, you know. And so, but he, he was instrumental in all kinds of things, like helping us in, like helping us uh, with electronics, uh, because you couldn't buy anything off the shelf back then in terms of robotics, helping us with, uh, 
you know, helping us with uh, you know PLCs for controlling uh, robot, you know, simple robots, you know, uh, simple sequencers for that, and 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 then that the fact that we were actually creating these working devices using what at the time was a fairly high technology that then attracted other people who were really back in the early or late 80s and early 90s and so then we you know we were you know all these machines you know it's always been pretty much about presentation value you know we're not we're not out there trying to reinvent anything practical even do anything practical it's just all about creating machines that can tell some kind of a strange story you know in different locations you know around the world and you know i think we you know i think it's generally recognized that we succeeded in doing that and so uh you know it's gone through a lot of iterations over the years uh that's uh here we go that's me that was me challenging mark raybert because he's he built that boston dynamics robot that threw a cinder block and so right afterwards i threw a cinder block further with the spine robot and so he was using that in presentations, that video in presentations, like at Boeing in the weapons research lab down there, making, talking about how we were making parody videos of his videos. But uh, I've never been able to talk him into using one of his machines at our shows, unfortunately. But so, so all these years, for 38 years, all my artist friends were going, oh my God, you know, you're going to be in all these museums, you're going to be in galleries, you know, all this stuff's going to happen. I was like, you know what, it's never going to happen. I just knew it. I didn't really know why, but as the years went on and we, our, our engagement with the art world was always sort of peripheral, even though they were, you know, like we did the groundbreaking for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and then the Museum of Modern Art promptly removed us from their history and tried to sue me after that. So, you know, that's been kind of the nature of the relationship. It's, uh, I wouldn't say love, hate, because hate's a very strong word. You know, love. I love the fact that these people provide fronts for me to do these events, because it's hard, hard to get per permission for them. We do get, you know, these are permitted events, but, you know, we live in a very permissive part of the world in California, so it's easy to get a start. Once you get a start, you can talk people into doing these things other places, but... Uh, but the art world is very the art, well, no, it's not that. I real, I, you know, I've always, I've always had my theories about why there was never, no, no one said, let's do a big show at a museum and stuff. So, a year, about a year ago, we got the call. I think through my wife here, the call from Marlboro Gallery, and they said, we want to do like, we want to do something with you, like in a real blue chip muse, you know, gallery setting. I'm like, okay. I said, that sounds great. You know, so went to New York, you know, we we're in the area. So we went to Marlboro and met them and they seemed really nice. And, you know, I don't, I don't have any basis to trust them or not trust them. They seemed, they, they talked a good talk. A couple months later, uh, the, you know, a year, you know, a year later, like in the, in the last summer, they said, let's really do this. We've got a slot open in January. We want to do like a big production with like tons of machines. We're going to fill this seven, five or 7,000 square foot gallery right in the Chelsea. And I'm like, wow, you know, these guys are serious. We're going to give you production money to help pay for it. And I'm like, wow, these guys are serious. You know, they transferred the money. And so we were on. And so we ended up, you know, the, the goal with SRL is to always take these technologies and really squeeze every last little bit of power and intensity out of them in a, these presentations, uh, short of injuring people or killing us when we're, I mean, the real danger is when you're working on the stuff. It's far more dangerous building big machines than it is actually staging them because there's, there's, there's more control uh, uh, it's a, more of a controlled setting. Being in a big factory is very dangerous. People get hurt in factories. We have a very good safety record with that way, a perfect safety record, except for me. But I'm the example that everyone stays safe by because I can just say, look what happens if you uh, are careless for like one instant. You're either dead or you're, you're uh, impaired you know, for the rest of your long life. So, uh, so anyway, so we did this show and so I wanted to get that same feeling of intensity, that same threat level, 
you know, that we that 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 technology, you know, pushed into like a, a powerful mechanism can 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 impress on people. And so we're in a gallery in Chelsea in Manhattan. I'm like, okay, what are we gonna do? You know? So the idea was to to just do, you know, I just said, let's just keep it simple. What would a physicist say? A physicist would say, you have to release as much energy in the shortest period of time as possible. And I'm like, okay, that's it. And, but you have to, you have to, uh, you've got to, you've got to stop it. And so that has how the title of the show came about. And I've got to get to the, I'm going to show a little video of the beginning of this show if I can figure out how to get out of here. Okay, here we go. So this is a short video. So this is the title. So I feel it's kind of topical, you know, like inconsiderate fantasies of negative acceleration characterized by sacrifices of a non-consensual nature. Because there's a lot of talk about non-consensualness these days, you know, and, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, here. Also, uh, let me get this up again. Uh, it was 20 below zero, the chill factor here. So we're, so first we, you know, we ran stuff outside, but like to really get the feeling of intensity that an SRL live show can give, I said, what we'll do is we'll just take the pitching machine, which is the most dangerous thing we have. It's a, it's a big, it's got a 400 and, a 500 cubic inch Eldorado motor, and it basically shoots six foot two by fours at 200 miles an hour. It's a machine gun for six foot two by fours. It shoots two per second, which is 20,000 joules of energy if you stop it suddenly. And so that's almost as much, that's more than a 50 caliber machine gun bullet. So I was like, okay, that's the key. The key is, is, is energy dissipation. And so we built a box Johnny over there spent a lot of hours on it. We built a bulletproof plastic box with half-inch Lexan that would handle 20,000 joules of energy immediately stopping. That was the inconsiderate fantasy of negative acceleration, which I also felt was very, you know, I try to get a little political jabs in every now and then. So it just seemed like as a society, we're kind of going backwards. So I thought, well, you know, let's just talk about the negative acceleration, you know, it's a, it seems like an important theme. So, uh, so we, what we did is we built this cube and right there in the gallery, you know, because we had an exhaust extraction system to extract all that fumes from the 500 cubic inch engine, we were able to fire 200 two by fours with people standing six inches away. And every time it hit that, you know, of course it was like a giant speaker. So there was like half inch plate with ribs in the back to break it apart. So. So that was that was sort of the centerpiece of this gallery exhibition. So we did this we did this outside. Uh, let me see if I can. Yeah. So this is outside in 20 below zero. The the gallery just said we'll just block the street off for you. So they just shut the street down for two hours in Manhattan. Nobody said a word to us, and so we just ran a few machines out in the street. A little love grabbing there handshaking between machines. So this machine on the left is the spine robot. Uh, Number eight. This is, that's the cube right there. And when that hits the wall, it's a freaking boom. So another safety first machine there, the rotary jaws that can actually bite a two by four and a half because of the kinematics of it. Uh, you see all these, you know, typical art looking people there. And you see it's all sealed off. It has the, you know, it's a little bit of design stuff, but it, we really, you know, this is at about a board 160 there. Doesn't quite convey the experience of it, and this is uh, this is like a, compu a computer-controlled walking machine. It's about this little bit bigger than an elephant, and it just has a simple PLC. We rebuilt that for this. Now here we have a 
our practical use for a Fanuc robot, which is to take a 55 inch screen and keep rotating it to make it really, moving it around to make it really hard to watch eight hours of our videos. So, so anyway, uh, so, so we did this show and the gallery was like, you know, sending us, sending, for, at first they were just sending me pictures like, God, this place is really crowded. Like, there's all these people in here like every day, like, and they sent me pictures showing that it was like packed with people. And I was like, huh, okay. And then after about two weeks of that, they just said, there's just millions of people there. They didn't even bother sending photos anymore. And, you know, the gallery, you know, it's a, the gallery is 120 years old from London. I mean, Marlboro goes back generations. The people that run the gallery have been running the gallery for generations. So it's old, like, you know, it's old gallery stuff. And so, you know, at the end, they were just like, wow, you know, it's just like, there's a, we've never had any show ever in our history that had this many people in it. And I was like, yeah, that's what it takes. You know, that's what happens when, you know, people, people are excited to see technology in a, you know, because frankly, here's, the, here's, the, here's my theory about why uh, here's, here's my theory. I have a general theory of, of, of uh, possibility, general theory of art in the technical world. Like everyone talks about how artists, no, no, the, the people in the tech world don't collect art. You know, and my theory, especially after this show, my theory is that, you know what, what it is is like people who work at tech companies, people who run tech companies, they don't want to sit around and talk to artists. They want to, they, all they think about in their lives is tech stuff. They want to talk about the latest gossip of Silicon Valley. They want to talk about something they read about, like, oh, this cool thing in robotics, you know, or there's this sensor here, or this is going on here. That's what they want to talk about. They don't want to hang around artists. Like back on the East Coast, where the art scene really is, it's like, you know, the rich people that pay for the stuff that invest in arts, they want to hang around artists because it's a cool, hip thing. And the fact, you know, if an artist is technically involved directly in the manufacture of something technical, then it's just like gross. It's like the maid, right? It's like, I don't want to talk to like someone who does anything real, you know? So you'll find, as I found all the way from back in the 80s and my friends in, you know, who were like up in the art world, like, you know, Kenny Sharp or Keith Haring, or, you know, those were friends of mine back in the 80s in, in New York. I would go to their places, it would be like a factory. It was all the Andy Warhol factory motif where they wouldn't do, they would do a sketch and like 20 people would build all this stuff for them. They didn't, you know, and so fast forward ahead to like tech art and you've got people, most of the people like, you know, someone like, okay, I'm gonna use an example that I used in the New York Times, I think, like Jordan Wolfson who did these really advanced robotics, kinematic sculptures of like a stripper, robot dancing in front of a mirror, okay? And so he didn't do any of that. He just found someone who's a friend of mine who does like, who does like uh, special effects in LA, and that guy built the whole thing for him for a million dollars. But that guy didn't, but he didn't know anything. He didn't know anything about, he just said, I want this robot that does this, we'll kind of make it dirty looking and, and have like a voice on it or something like that. He just kind of, he was the director of it, you know. And that traditionally is the role of artists in uh, art and technology type of events. And I find that revolting because I believe that to, to be doing this stuff and if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be telling a story with technology that's outside of the range of the practical or the productive, you really have to have sweat equity in it. You know, I really believe that's important. Of course, I would believe that's important because I do spend so much of my time actually physically making the stuff that is in these shows. So, you know, I think that's important. And, you know, when we did this show and agreed to this show at Marlboro, I set out to try to make that point and to try to, you know, to see if we could convince anybody to, uh, to step up the plate and buy anything. And Marlboro totally pushed it. They had all these meetings. And in the end, I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but the CEO of a very large tech company goes, okay, I've gotta have, I've just gotta have an SRL machine in my corporate lobby. And I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to make it happen. So he came to visit me. I, gave him a proposal, and then he went off to the gallery, and they cut the deal, and you know, it, money changed hands, and 
So now we're in the process of making this machine. So this is the first test case for this type of machine. So I'm going to show you a little bit about it. Uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, if, uh, let me see here, let me get to where we are here. I got to get to, but I don't know if any of you, you probably do an awful lot of sensor stuff here. I'm sure you do. But I doubt if any of you have seen the newer uh, Intel RealSense sensors. Uh, you know, we're sort of, I'm acquaintances with the guy who ran, basically ran the lab there. And so I met with him like a year and a half ago. and He said, we're going to do some kind of a project at some point. And so, uh, so I told him about this project and he got really excited about it. And he goes, you know, our sensor is the perfect thing for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit about what it is first, just a real quick thing. So, you know, again, the, the central focus of SRL and all this repurposing of technology stuff, the, the focus is always to preserve the intensity and the power of the technology. And, you know, as a guiding rule, you know, you know as a rule of thumb, my initial, my idea was always that every one of these machines should be able to kill you. You know, anything in one of our shows should be capable of killing a person. That was like just the general rule of thumb. So to preserve that across different types of presentation, I mean, the gallery presentation at Marlboro certainly preserved that because, believe me, tires, truck tires, Mack truck tires that you saw there are not really designed to go 200 miles an hour. I mean, the guy at Goodyear said it would probably work, but... You know, there is a risk involved in, in spinning tires up. You know, there's a risk in any kinematic. Anytime you have that much energy, there's a risk. It's, you know, it's scary. I mean, whether it's a real risk or a perceived risk, but it's really intense to be there seeing it happen. It's intense for me to be operating it. Uh, even having, like, that big walking machine operating in a gallery full of people. I mean, any, you know, people with a drink in their hand, they fall into it. I mean, there's always, you know, there's, I mean, we exist and we, we, uh, we persist in this and we continue to get away with it based on the fact that we manage it carefully. We manage the risk carefully. We make sure that people aren't too close to the machines uh, in the gallery setting or in the shows. You know, everyone's always on the lookout for, for any kind of risk. But at the same time, you want to maximize the intensity of it. So we th I think we've, we've done pretty good. So, so anyway, so I was faced with this question. And the question was, how am I going to make that, uh, you know, the sort of the, the, the directive of SRL of having the intensity, how is that going to work if it's a machine that's for display in a lobby? And I was like, okay. So here we find our, okay, let's see. So my idea was to just, you know, everyone talks about, uh, Everyone talks about machines that are going to, like, chase us down and kill us, right? There's, like, you know, there was just that big snafu in South Korea where there was an actual lab that was formed strictly for developing autonomous weapons. And then once that came out publicly, everyone's like, oh, my God, like, we can't do that, you know? It's, like, terrible and, you know, uh, and all these people pulled out of it. And so I said, you know what? I think what would be cool is to, why not just like quit, cut to the chase and let's make a machine that actually is designed to hunt people and kill them and put it behind something safe like a half inch bulletproof plastic and that will be what we're going to do. So, you know, the idea was to make an arm. So this is just a folded view of the arm. It's about six feet long and it's using a... Uh, it's using a, uh, a drive system. It's using a, a high pressure, uh, like a poppet valve, uh, high pressure gas system to launch it at this pivot, uh, the pivot in the lower left there. And you know, I adjusted the linkages so it would get a good drive off of that. So the, 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 car, the, the cylinder is running at 800 PSI, which is the native pressure of CO2. So you've got basically 800 PSI over three inches in diameter. So with no flow losses, because it's using a poppet valve that exposes a port that's bigger than the, di but twice the diameter of the piston itself. So you really don't have any flow losses. And so that is going to launch that arm out at about 
200 miles an hour. So there's all kinds of, uh, I'm a little cumbersome with my, all kinds of uh, breaking stuff that I've designed into here. And let me get to the other arm. So this is the production drawing for it, or the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah, so I think it's this one, yeah. Ah, so that's the arm extended there. And let me find the other one here. Yeah, so, you know, this, this all came up really quick, and I had to think fast, right? Because it was like, I didn't want to miss the sale, right? And so... Uh, cannot find the drawing over here. But anyway, so in December, there was a video that was kind of online, you know, kind of went, I guess it went a little bit viral. It was like, I don't know where it was. I think maybe it was in China, but there was like a albino tiger and it was in a Lexan shield. And there was a guy talking on his phone. Someone was videotaping, he's talking on his phone. And the tiger like sort of snuck up behind the guy and got maybe eight feet away from him and somebody, he looked up, the person on the phone said, hey, you know, there's a tiger behind just getting all crazy. And the guy turned around, and the second he turned around, it jumped on him. The full eight-foot white tiger jumped and smashed against the Lexan. I was like, wow, that was, that's kind of interesting. Like, it really it was like hunting him down and stuff like that. That was exciting. And uh, I was like, yeah, I want to make a machine that does that. I want to make a machine that hunts people and attacks them, and I can't, not, I cannot find the other picture of this, but anyway. Yeah, and so, so anyway, that's the idea. There was a, there was a, uh, there was a presentation drawing of that. I swear I put it on here, but I don't see it on here, so I'm not going to worry about it. So anyway, so that's the, that's the basic idea. You can see that it's got, uh, we've got some, uh, you know, here's the, it's mounted on a, on a, like a, uh, like a cylinder basically with, with a couple servo, a pretty simple system, a few servo motors and like just Modbus talking to, talking to the software uh, from the sensor. And, you know, we've got a claw with uh, an underactuated type claw with, uh, and behind it, we're using for, for spring, uh, for, for shock absorbers, we're using urethane springs which is common in the tool and die industry. They don't use steel springs, they use urethane, different durometers. And so that's, that, that breaks when the claw hits the, uh, when the, claw hits the, uh, the Lexan at 150 miles an hour, that'll absorb a little bit of that. Uh, and you can see these, the linkages, the linkage up there and the linkage there, those are also sliding tubes with urethane springs in them. So that takes away that takes a little bit of the energy from the driving, the acceleration, and it also handles a little bit of the energy, dissipates a little bit of the energy from the deceleration. And so it's all gonna be made out of four by four uh, aluminum square bar, and I, I've got a big five axis CNC machine, a big DMG five axis CNC machine. So we're gonna mill it out so it looks like an alien artifact, really just uh, with basically spars down the middle and all milled out on the sides. Uh, this is sort of a variation on an arm that's on the back of a, a MIT running machine right now. Not, not Mark Raybert's machines, but it's a, so it's actually, we call it the predator arm, but actually it's more of a predator leg, but a predator leg doesn't really sound as good as a predator arm. So for practical purposes, we're calling it that. And so you know, essentially what this does is it uses this sensor here, this Intel RealSense sensor, which I can turn on for you. Uh, what we're doing is we're going to use that, and when a group of people come up to it, uh, right now I think what, we're, what we've decided we're going to be using is, uh, we're using this because it has a, uh, a skeleton detection mode in it, which is pretty useful for what we're doing. And if it rotates on that, yeah, I'm trying to find the... Yeah. So if I can find the 
Okay, so here is an example. And I don't really know how many skeletons it'll detect. Okay, so anyway, you can see if someone wants to stand in front here, okay, a little bit closer. And see, so, so those dots are like your joints. So you can see that it's doing that in real time. And it, we don't know how many it can model, but if we get a couple other, every, every different person is, is just in, notated as a different color on this. But, uh, but the important thing is that this, uh, it can handle multiple subjects and it can tell where your body is, what your body's doing. So you can basically then program uh, your rules for it so that, uh, you know, if two people are talking and their arms are up, when their arms go down and they turn away, like they're not, as soon as you see that they're not paying attention, then you can attack. So you can program, you can model sort of predator behaviors. You can see it's now, now that it's found them, it's detecting them all the way back into the, all the way back into the back of the room. And so each person gets a different color assigned. You know, in this, they get a different color. There's another version of this that, I, that we haven't been able to get to run yet. I think because the firmware on the camera needs to be updated to the latest firmware. There's another one that then just that creates a stick figure. So this is just creating the, the, the joints where your pivots are. So the cool thing about this is that unlike in the past when, uh, you know, when we had to design and build all of our own electronics at SRL. Uh, what's great about this, uh, you know, you can get stuff like this for $150. This, this sensor is $150. Bucks. And, like, I bought the software that's doing all this back-end stuff for $50. Bucks. And, like, so now all we have to do is write the, the hooks from this out to our servo motors and out, you know, out there and, and create that level, that level, the higher level software, which is actually pretty, not, I mean, it's not that hard to do. So imagine trying to do this a few years ago. You'd have to have a team of people. You'd have to have like, you know, I need a million dollars or I can't take a breath, you know. I mean, it would be really uh, impossible to do. But now on an artist's budget, it's possible to, to create a machine that, uh, you know, basically will hunt people down and, and try to get you. And so uh, this is going to be part of an addition of five. And believe, you know, this is all was described to the client. And the client's a CEO of a huge company. He was like, that's great. You know, that's just a great thing. Someone really needs to do this. And like, we're going to put it in our lobby in like a Europe, big European city. And I'm like, great. I like that, you know, like that's what I, I really like. I love to see, you know, because that's, you know, another part of the whole aspect of SRL because, you know, you really, it's very hard to get, you know, permission to, to do these kind of shows. You know, typically you would think, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to be allowed to cr do something that disruptive? How are you going to run a V1 in downtown San Francisco? You know, like technically these things aren't permitted. How are you going to use explosives in downtown Tokyo? You know, technically you shouldn't really be able to do that, but, you know, part of the, but, but you can't just do it and, and just say, I'm just going to do this and everyone's going to feel good about it because they're not going to feel good about it and you're going to get into a lot of trouble and everyone's going to be really mad. So uh, I always make sure that we create a co-conspirator network with institutions and that's how we're able to do these things. And it seems really impossible, and it just seems, you know, but the, the simple fact is, is that, you know, people are excited about uh, subversive uses of things, you know, things that are outside the envelope. I mean, you know, a lot of people, you know, we have a lot of people working with us at SRL, some of the same people that have been working with us for 35 years. And they're all like, uh, you know, mucky mucks at Google X, and, you know, they have their fancy jobs, a lot of them, but they'll, when there's a show that comes up, they'll literally take vacation time off to come and work on the productions because people, you know, it's a, it's, it, you know, it's, I, there, there's a certain awareness that, you know, a certain freshness that I think people who work in the technology sphere get from taking it outside of the sphere that they're, that everyone says it's supposed to be in and actually getting something done. I mean, we, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, 
we've we've kind of we've kind of turned in. You know, I think we, we've we've done a lot of things. I think I've see I see mirrored in other companies. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, like rather than you know rather than me going to get my doctorate in uh, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, I I came to the realization when I was like looking through all these factors. I said, you know what? All these parts just already fit together. All you have to do is like kind of like get them close enough and connect them all, and you don't need to really know much of anything. You know, you basically just need to know how to read, how to understand, you know, some basic things and read up on it. Well, you know, now really, you have whole companies that are based on that. From what I understand, from a lot of people that work at Google, if you really understand how to read scientific papers, to find the right scientific papers, read them, really understand them, and really know how to read a user manual, you can get hired. That's like a very important part of uh, technology, you know, in, in practical application of technology. If you can do those things, we don't really care. Like, like I have friends who work at Google X, and like so basically until you get embarrassed by the old ones, you can just kind of get away with it. And he was like telling me, oh yeah, we're in these meetings and there's all these young people in there that are like, they've got their degrees, but they don't really know what the old people know. They don't really know what us old ones know. And he was describing this one where you'll only get the joke here, I'm sure, but he was talking about the frequency of some device. And uh, he was talking about some analog device, a completely analog device that can handle, a, you know, the is a very extreme device. Uh, and so this one guy kept going, well, what's the frequency that it can operate? And Greg, you know, my friend Greg goes, well, it's an analog device, so there's really no frequency to it. And he goes, well, I don't understand. Like, what frequency is it at? And finally, the head guy at the table goes, uh, such and such. He goes, uh, he goes, it's an analog device. He goes, Dig it's not a digital device. And he goes, well, what do you mean? He goes, it's it's a di not a digital device. And the guy goes, oh. And so he's made a whole life of himself at Google embarrassing people that don't really have this kind of rigorous scientific training that an older generation had. The, you know, people that would be working, you know, people who are professors here probably or work at Slack or something like that. So, uh, but I think that that's you know that's the, the 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 priority is if you're trying to just get real things done you know you're basically borrowing as much as you can from people who have already created the building blocks you know and that's a more efficient model because there is so much stuff out there and you know you know that's uh it's how like an organization like SRL can go from you know from uh, do these kind of projects and build these kind of devices and stage shows without really having any money, for one thing, and without really, you know, with, with, with me not really having professional training, you know, I was able to uh, leverage my just sort of intuitive awareness of, of uh, engineering and devices to the, you know, to, to an extent that allowed it to happen. I don't really know how it happens. I don't really know how I figure out things, but everything I've ever decided is going to work that I've built at SRL has always worked. And there's always been people who are going, that's never going to work. You're never going to get a rail gun to like spray molten metal in a controlled way, five or 600 feet, or how, you're never going to make a shockwave cannon that uses like a, basically like a shock tube, you know, and a, a, a methane and oxygen to create a shock wave that can travel through the air. That's, you know, how are you gonna figure that out? And like, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to use like some kind of flow dynamic program to do it. I just sort of guessed that it would work based on the fact that I had a Mattel toy called the Sonic Blaster when I was 11 that worked. And I was like, it's so simple what it does. Like you just have to get, you just have to create, you know, like a, a jet of air to, traveling at a high speed, and it folds it into a toroid, and that toroid will, you know, it's just guessing, basically. So, you know, it's, it's from a point of ignorance, but I still, uh, it still seems to be effective enough for entertainment purposes. And so, 
One last thing that I want to do, because I guess my time is getting close to up. I don't know how much more time it has, but one really important thing I want to show people here is we did a show on, I'm going to show you, we want to go on the Wayback Machine, not the computer Wayback Machine, but the Wayback Machine that was before the internet. And uh, this is something that was allowed to happen on the Stanford campus that I don't think you would probably see much anymore, and that is, that is a show with these machines right in front of the dean's office. And uh, back in 1987, we did a show in front of the dean's office. So this is what you used to be able to do here. But anyway, so what we did is, uh, you know, there was an international design conference at Stanford. See if this, and so they just asked us if we wanted to do a show. And, uh, you know, it was in 1987. I said, oh, we'll totally do a show in the daytime and at Stanford. And they go, well, the only place we can really do this is right in front of the dean's office. Is that okay? This is what the administrators here, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the only open space around here that we can do it at. And I was like, sure, we'll do it there. And so we just did this show, like, right in front of the dean's office, and it was really extreme. And then, you know, like, I thought, oh, they're going to be really pissed about this. But in fact, they weren't. They, everyone was just, like, acted like it was totally a normal thing, which was kind of amazing. But, uh, I mean, the other thing we could do is I could connect, I could get online, and I could just download it from the interwebs on our YouTube channel. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Conspiracy theories. What? Conspiracy <laughs> theories? <laughs> yes, I can play it. You can? Do you have a DVI output on your HDMI output? No, that's the problem. Well, we've got all kinds of outputs here. Yeah, see if you can. How about, uh, do you have a, a SV, uh, SVGA output? No. Well, we could just look at it on the screen, put it right in front of here, and you could look at it. It's not very high. We didn't have the most high, you know, we were, we were in like early beta, pre-beta SP. I think this was shot in, in beta cam was before they put the SP on it. But does anybody have any questions while we're seeing if we can do that? Yes? So you're building... Like big machines, but if you want to use a lot of power, you thought about instead doing swarms of small machines. We've done that already. In fact, I did a whole presentation on that. And in fact, we had a competition with uh, Rodney Brooks at MIT for swarming machines back in 1989 and 90. And so we, I bet Rodney Brooks, me and my group of people, uh, Raymond Drury, uh, Jonathan Levine, and I forget who else, but we bet, I bet Rodney Brooks that we could get our AI life swarming machines to work before he could. He goes, well, we'll see. And so in fact, and, and so we, he kept calling me, so did you get yours working yet? I said, would you get yours working yet? He said, well, no, not yet. And so I called him up and I said, we've got ours working. And so there were a group of his grad students that were out in San Francisco and they, uh, they came over and we showed them working and they said, yours worked before ours. So, so anyway, so that's the, that, that was with the swarmers. And basically it was all homemade. They were about as big as a 55 gallon drum and about that tall. We made five of them. And so what they, they, they ran is very simple, this is 1990. So they had infrared sensors and a rotating mirror, you know, that was, uh, they didn't work outside. They didn't work in a building with bright light. Uh, and so uh, basically what they would do is they would look for each other when they would identify which one of the five it was, and then they would move towards each other. And when they got close, too close, they would move away from ah, each other. Okay. And so what, you know, like a typical simple A-Life program like that, you can hit that and right. let it go. Okay. So basically what it would do is it would, uh, you know, look, it, they would take, make these kind of interesting patterns of movement, like chasing each other around. And uh, eventually they get stuck in a corner because they weren't detecting anything in the real world except each other. But so, yeah. So this is in front of the dean's office. 
That's just a simple walking machine run by a PLC. That's the original one that was installed by Stanford doctorate student Phil Paul back in 86, 87. So this was what was considered normal on campus in 1987. This was just a normal afternoon at Stanford. Nothing unusual, you know, free for anybody to see. That's the flippy box. That is like, if you read too much, you start to get ideas about books that are different from what you should be getting. And... Uh, So it's not, I don't hear the sound now, but that's okay. So that's another crazy thing. Up, square wheel car. Attacking another machine. And that's it. It was like about seven or eight minutes long, I think. So anyway, so I just thought that that would be, thank you. Everyone would be interested to know that that was just considered a normal thing. I don't think you would be able to probably do that anymore, but uh, you know, then again, I'm always surprised by what people allow you to do. I mean, uh, you know, but uh, but you know, I just I just think that from in 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 terms of like being a technical person and being an engineer, uh, you know, looking forward into the future, I like to think that we are sort of prefiguring some possibilities and one of those I think is really important that I just wanted to make sure I brought up was that you know everyone talks about oh yeah you know if you've got an education and you've got all these skills you'll always have a job but you know what if there are no jobs I mean at a certain point there just are going to be a lot fewer jobs at a certain point there's a point there's you reach a peak and technology stops creating jobs and there's been many books written about that and technology starts taking away jobs and so you have to create new jobs. And so what I like to think is that SRL is a template for a future where there may not be any jobs. But, you know, people are not, you know, I don't think you're really human unless you have a purpose. And so having a purpose now means your purpose is tied in with the latest technology. I mean, it should. If you really want to feel the real power of like what it means to be human, you've got to tie your life to technology and you've got to really be an engineer if you want to feel real satisfaction, but you also have to have something to do with it. And I think that, you know, a future where, you know, we revert back to the medieval model of like the ultra gazillionaire, soon to be trillionaires out there will just be bleeding, sweating money, and so if you want to absorb any of the tears of, of uh, you know, a, a sweat that's falling off of them, you get, you're going to have to develop, you know, a way to uh, use your training, use your skills, use your interests, and to create, you know, you're going to have to say, this is a job, this is an important thing, and you're going to have to get in on the, on the ground floor, and, and I think that that's you know, being involved in a creative expression of the arts, a creative expression of your engineering skills is a good way to do it because, you know, it's a good way to have human dignity and to have a reason to be doing what you're doing. And, and I also just think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the way of the future. And, uh, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to show how it works with, uh, with, you know, I'm going to be trying to do more of these, sort of art project type things and trying to sell them. I mean, partly just to make an income stream because it gets very expensive uh, when you're working outside of an institution and you have to pay for everything yourself and you don't have a trust fund. You have to figure out creative ways of financing. Uh, and so I need additional means of financing. And so that's one of the reasons why I kind of took this path. But in the process of doing it, you know, it's, it's, I've really, a lot of things that I've thought about over the years, uh, I realize that, that, that they're, you know, that they're, uh, could come to fruition. So I'm going to take some more questions. I've talked enough. I'm tired of talking about it. Well, it seems like. I could be the only expert on SRL out there. 
it seems like there's, there's I've got two more here though. There's something about that that subversion and the dignity about sort of taking the taking the piss out of the technology and and creating it into something that's fun that maintains that that dignity. I've never heard you use that term before, but it's really true. There is, but what if there's no what if there what if there's a diminishing number of practical reasons to even do anything? You know, then what happens? I mean, right now there's a million, you know, we need someone we need engineers to do this. We everyone talks about their shortage of engineers to to create their products, but what at a certain point, what happens is if if so much of that stuff becomes automated and done by non humans that there's no baseline to compare subversion to, you know, then like What's subversive then is are the machines subversive that are doing everything, or are the are the people that you know what the, sub, the subversive thing would probably be that if you're still willing to do something basically on spec, you know if you're doing it because you love to do it basically. Yeah. Well, I think the right. art critic Dave Dickey talks about the most subversive thing you can do is create something beautiful, and there's a beauty in the destruction that we create. I feel well. <laughs> but that's my own twisted body. Not for math, not for math consumption. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was going to ask something along those lines. Is you were saying how the the guesswork element um, kind of works for the entertainment purposes, um, but it is like is this a moral imperative for you? Like I don't want it to be to like look pretty and look precise, or like or you know is that driving you, or is it just like it works for me and you know people like this and it's good, but it could be another way. Kind of well. You know, I'm a, sort of a, of the I'm of the opinion that is expressed in, for instance, a book like *War in the Age of Intelligent Machines*, where who's directing who? You know, I don't know if you ever read that book. It's a book by Manuel Deland, a very important sort of treatise on like what our role is as humans in relation to the machines or technology we're building, right? And he sort of turns it on its head and sort of makes a bunch of you know. Uh, interesting points about it, but uh, you know, I think that for me, it's all, the important thing has always been trying to preserve the intensity and the ferocity of technology. And so I see, where some people see a bottling machine, I see some terrifying nightmare, you know, that could be made with that bottling machine, you know, with all the parts for it. And like that, to me, is the truest expression of like what the the purest expression of what is going on there. Like, you can see, you know, there's all the excitement of a, you know, of a process machine. There's like something coming in on one end, and then there's the process, and then there's the end result. And so that's beautiful, you know, but why does it have to, why can't it just go from, why can't it just start from something, create something, and then destroy it at the end? That's a process too. But but having it having it a process which is destructive preserves some important things about a machine. It preserves the idea that it has more power, more speed than a human, because it can do something that a human couldn't do. It be, it becomes it becomes uh, superhuman, and so by having it do something destructive and really intense like that, that's the easiest way to prove to make a proof for the superhuman powers of, of a servo mechanism or a device that projects our you know, power somehow through technology. And so, uh, so I like to preserve those things in the machines. That's why, like I said, the, the baseline is always that you have, to, you have to, when you're confronted with an SRL machine, it has to be something that's scary and intimidating and physically uh, uh, empower, you know, physically threatening. So let's take the microphone away, then you can tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. About what? <laughs> About anything. I'll but, take but, any, but, any. But there's a, a suspension of disbelief that all those things that look like mics hanging from the ceiling <laughs> are not microphones. Okay, good. Or that they're not turned on. Okay, well, this one's off. Well, yeah, but until it's out of the room, you won't believe that it's not working. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, should we should give him a hand. <laughs>